well. I am so happy that a little cold weather didn't keep you away from church this morning. We're really glad you're here. Let's warm up our blood by standing up and singing praise to God. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. If you're following along in the hymnal, we're singing the first four verses. If you're following the screens, the words will be with you. Let's, let me hear you sing out really loudly. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you should be in the choir. Aren't you glad you came this morning? You get a hug. Can't do that when you sit at home and watch preaching on television. Lord, I lift your name on high. We're going to sing it through twice. Ready, everybody? Let me hear ya. Yeah. 
may be seated. Lord, I lift your name on high. What name are we going to lift on high today? The name of Jesus, because there's something about that name. there is something about that name of Jesus. He's the one who's brought us to worship even on a, a cold, chilly January Sunday morning. I want to welcome every one of you to worship. Uh, so good to see each and every one of you. I was talking to Blaine a minute ago. I said we, we must have changed deodorant because nobody's sitting near us down here. And, and Blaine, I said, Blaine says it's because we stopped. I don't know, but... Uh, We'll hear more about that from him, but uh, good to see all of you here today as we have gathered to worship together. If you would, please take a moment, find your attendance pads. If you'd please sign in your name, address, your phone number, we'd be glad to have that from you. This afternoon, take a good look at the bulletin, a, a number of uh, events that are upcoming. I do want to highlight a few. Uh, first, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, the youth will be meeting. Also, please give attention to the big announcement from COAT. A cooperative outreach of Archdale Trinity as they have a drive to collect shoes, coats, and food for needy people. So please uh, be generous toward that. Also, uh, two weeks from today, January the 25th, the Jeff Patterson class will be hosting a delicious southern brunch. Delicious because some of the folks have already told me what's on the menu. You know it's going to be great. It's also going to be a good time for us to say a very special thank you and farewell to Travis Qualls and all of his family. So mark your calendars for that. So just wanted to share those few things with you. It is now time for children's moments. Amy Walker's leading that today. So Amy, if you'd come down, if the kids would come join her, and then they're excused for children's church. Good morning. Small group, y'all got to be thinking. Are you ready? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I think we're losing one. Um, I wore a shirt today that I wore on a trip this summer, and I talked about it in Sunday school. And so when Stuart um, asked me this week if I could share children's moments, I said, sure, I'll be happy to. What are you, um, what's your message going to be about? So we could kind of make sure we're sort of on the same page. He said what he was going to be talking about this morning with the grown-ups, and he said, so just anything, Jesus. And I was like, mm, wow, <laughs> that narrows it down. <laughs> right. <laughs> so since I was talking about um, this trip I went on, I thought, why not share the same thing with you guys? Now, some of y'all are big and old, and I can tell you go to school, and you're really smart. Can you, what's that big word on my shirt say? Hope. It says hope. What, um, can anybody, like, 
that's kind of a hard word to describe. Can anybody try to describe it? What do you think? Like something that brings you joy when you think about it, kind of. I did not pay him to say that. That was really, really, really good. Um, that's perfect. Um, I looked it up because I didn't even know if I could put it exactly into words. Um, so the definition in the dictionary, here we're really close, to look and wait for or to want something good to happen or joy, right? You could say that, hope and joy. So when I went on this little trip, I work at the dentist. Y'all ever been to the dentist? Yeah, grown-ups, anybody? Dentist? Everybody loves to go to the dentist. No, <laughs> they're all shaking their head. So we took, I took what I know about teeth and Jesus and went to this place called Guatemala over the summer in uh, July. So um, this was our missionary t-shirt that we were taking hope to Guatemala. So we were giving them something to look forward to. And there's a verse in the Bible, Isaiah 6, 8, and it says, here am I, send me. So a lot of people that go on mission trips, they use that verse and say, well, we're being sent to, you know, wherever. So if I went to Guatemala, does anybody, any of you plan on going to Guatemala anytime soon? Yeah, you have to get on a plane and it's out in the water and not, you can't, can't just do that at the drop of a hat. You can't just pick up and go tomorrow. But where are you going to be going tomorrow? School. Are you going to school tomorrow? Yeah? You going to school tomorrow? And I have to go to work tomorrow? So do you know that as Christians, you're supposed to take hope with you wherever you go. And we can give people joy and something to look forward to. Because as Christians, we have the hope that Jesus is coming back and he's going to take us all. And we can give other people hope just by giving them a smile or giving a hug or walking all the way across the room and picking up something somebody dropped or going all the way down the street and around the corner and taking somebody something when they don't feel good. That's hope too, right? So you don't have to go far. You just have to look around and pay attention and give somebody hope and show them Jesus' love, okay? So have hope this week and share it with somebody, all right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, and we most of all thank you for the hope that you've given all of us um, and in your love and that we can share that with others. Thank you for these children and for the bright light that they bring to all of us each day. In your name we pray. Amen. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. What a wonderful group of faces this is. I wish you could see it from my side. It's great to have you here at Archdale United Methodist Church, and we thank you for coming, and we want you to join us this morning in our call to prayer. Our call to prayer is going to be from number 174 in the United Methodist Hymnal, and our prayer response will be from 177. And they will be on the screen if you prefer that.
Loving Father, we want to approach you as a congregation of your people dedicated to you to express our love to you. And Father, at this time, because of our human frailties, we measure our lives in year to year. And at the beginning of each year, we look at our lives and we want to do better than we did before. And we commit ourselves often to you. And then through the year, Father, somehow we stumble, somehow we fall. We don't do everything that we've said we would do. And we realize, Father, that we're weak and that we have to come back to you and ask for that strength and that spirit so that we can accomplish the things that we've said we want to do for you. And so this morning, Father, we're going to ask for a special portion of your spirit. We're going to ask that you pour it on each and every one of us, that you reach down into our hearts and give us confidence and give us peace and give us the joy that comes from doing your will. And then, Father, make us steadfast in it. Make us move forward doing what we've committed to you to do. For, Father, you're doing for us what you committed with your life to do. Help us, Father, to reach out to other people. Help us to show them that love that you've shown for us. Help us to be a light in a dark world. We ask that, and we ask it again at the first of this year. But we also ask, Father, for that steadfastness. Help us as you helped your disciples to learn the most important things and to share them with others. Help us to know what is most important because you helped them to know what was most important. You taught them, Father, to pray a special prayer that showed them what was most important. You taught them to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we want to be a part of everything that goes on in your kingdom, and we want to share in every possible way that we can, and so we ask that you take this offering and use it for the accomplishment of your will. We beg that in Christ's name, amen.
That was Jesus, lover of my soul. What a blessing in song that was. A, a blessing to each one of us as we heard it today. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Cheryl. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Colossians. I want you to look at chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. John chapter, or John, I'm jumping around the Bible today. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. 23. We're beginning a new series of messages today, and the, the series is called uh, Start the Year with Jesus. We're going to look at how we can start a whole new year with Jesus. We're going to look at it today, the next three Sundays as well. But today we're looking at a letter that Paul, the great leader in the church, he was inspired to write. It was a letter to the, the churches and the Christians in the city of Colossae. So let's see what it says here. In Colossians, the first chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. It says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. I have seen it on billboards and banners. I've seen it on buttons and bracelets. I've seen it on bumper stickers and Bible covers. I've seen it on t-shirts, sweatshirts, and hoodies. I've seen it on necklaces and neckties. I've seen it on shoestrings and stationery. What I am describing are four letters of our alphabet, the four letters WWJD. You know, they all stand for what would Jesus do? And we have seen that plastered on about every object in the world, haven't we? 
Let's do a simple survey. How many of you here today own something that contains the letters WWJD? Just a simple show of hands. Let's see some more hands. I know all of you probably own something that says WWJD. But do you know where WWJD came from? I know some of you may be thinking to yourself, well, it was a real smart Christian marketing idea about 25 years ago, wasn't it? To take those four letters, put them on any kind of object, market them, sell them, and I believe over the years it has become a billion-dollar industry. Well, the origins of WWJD go way back before the last 25 years. Some of you may have read a, a book came out in 1896, and no, none of you were born and alive then, I know that. But back in 1896, there was a book written by a man, his name was Charles Sheldon, and the name of the book was In His Steps. And the storyline of the book was this, there was a pastor in a church, and, and that church, they all decided that they were going to live by those four letters, WWJD. They were going to ask, what would Jesus do? And so again, the plot of the book unfolds as the church, the people, the pastor, they face all of these situations in life, all of these hard decisions come up, but anytime there's a challenge, they kind of stop dead in their tracks, and they ask, what would Jesus do? And they let that dictate their decision. Well, that may be when WWJD was first copyrighted, but the idea, the concept, goes back even further. In fact, it's almost 2,000 years old. You want to know where it comes from? Go back to about the year 60 A.D. The church is expanding in every direction. The gospel is being shared. People are coming to faith in Christ. Churches are being established. One of the reasons is because the 15 years leading up to that, a man by the name of Paul, he has been traveling the known world telling people about Jesus and sharing his love and inviting people to put their faith in Jesus. On one of his many missionary journeys, Paul stops in a city called Ephesus. And as he shares the story of Jesus there, there is one day a man by the name of Epaphras. You ever heard that name before? You ever thought about naming one of your kids Epaphras? I'm glad I don't see any nods on that one today. But this man, Epaphras, he hears Paul talk about Jesus and what he did and how he loves and what he can do in our lives. And that day, Epaphras makes a decision to believe in Jesus and to give his life to Jesus. And you know, Epaphras is so excited and so filled with joy about that that he goes back to his hometown, the city of Colossae. And when he gets there, he tells other people there about Jesus. And they come to believe too. And a, a church is established in that city. And it begins to flourish and it begins to grow. And this happens over the years. And as I said, up until about the year 60 A.D., in the meantime, this man Paul has completed his missionary journeys and in a terrible act of persecution, he's arrested, he's put in prison in Rome. But even there, God lays it upon the heart of this man Paul to write letters to the churches, to encourage them, to build them up. And one of those churches that God places upon his heart is the church in Colossae. Now, Paul had never, ever been to that city, to the church there. But he knew about the church. He knew how faithful and devoted they were. But he also had become aware that they faced a temptation. And the temptation was to allow the false religions and the pagan way of thought in that area to kind of infiltrate their beliefs and how they lived out their faith. And so, led of God, Paul writes a letter to the Colossians. It begins like almost all of Paul's other letters. He announces his name, Paul. He announces the destination of the letter to the holy people in Colossae. He expresses to them how grateful he is to them. And then he lets them know that he is praying for them. And then with that formal kind of introduction, he's ready to launch into the body of the letter. He is ready to address the issue. Again, the challenge before them 
to be led astray by other ways of thinking and other value systems. And he addresses the issue in a wonderful way by lifting up the person of Jesus Christ. And that statement is what I read for you just a few moments ago. As it begins there in verse 15, he describes Jesus as the very Son of God. He explains how everything that's ever been made was created through him and how Jesus holds everything together. And he's the Lord of the whole universe. As we get to verse 18, he kind of narrows his focus a little bit. He goes from talking about all of creation to talking about the believers, the church. He says in verse 15, 18 and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy and then again he names off some basic truths about jesus that he was god in human flesh and he came to reconcile a sinful human race to a holy and loving god he reminds them of something and he could very well be speaking to us when he says in verse 21, once you were alienated from God. But then he goes on to explain how Jesus, through his death on the cross, his resurrection, brings us back into fellowship with God. And one day, because of that, we will stand before God holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. And then at the end of verse 23, he just simply says this, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the greatest news of all. Yes, the church at Colossae, they faced a great temptation. They were being pulled by all that was going on in the world to live differently and, and not to put Jesus in the place that belonged to him. It's a temptation we all face too. And in response to this, Paul gives this beautiful statement about Jesus. And right in the heart of it again, I've got to read it again, is verse 18. He says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. That's my favorite phrase of this whole passage. Speaking of Jesus, it says, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Do you know what that is? That is Paul's way of saying WWJD. That was Paul's way of putting Jesus first and above everything. And you know, as I've been thinking about that passage this week and, and praying over, it's kind of brought to mind a phrase in my mind, a phrase I want to share with you, a phrase I want you to take home. And just like WWJD, it is four words. And the four words are these. A Jesus first life. A Jesus first life. That's what I hear Paul saying here. As he says of Jesus, so that in all things and everything, he might have the supremacy. That was Paul's word and the word of God to the church at Colossae. And I'm convinced it's the word of God to every one of us too. Because it is a challenge to us. It is an encouragement to us. It is an invitation to every one of us to live a Jesus first life. Are you living a, a Jesus first life? What exactly does that mean? If I could sum it up in one word, it would be priorities priorities one day two men were out playing golf and they got to the fifth hole it was a par five and right beside that hole was this busy road through town they got up and hit their tee shots right in the middle of the fairway and as they were walking to their where their balls were they looked over to the road and a funeral procession was coming by and one of those two golfers stopped right in his tracks turned to the procession almost stood at attention took off his hat put it over his heart his partner looked at him and said, I've never noticed you to be a sentimental, soft-hearted guy like that. I'm impressed. The man with the hat over his heart said, well, it's the least I could do. She and I have been married for 47 years. <laughs> go to his wife's funeral or go play golf. Said something about his priorities, didn't he? 
What are your priorities? Are you living a Jesus first life? I want us to look at a Jesus first life. And I want us to look at it from two angles. The first one is this. It is your life. Think about your own life. Are you living a Jesus first life? It's been some 20 years ago that I went to a revival meeting down at New London United Methodist Church, just north of Albemarle. I still remember that night. I remember the preacher. His name was Mark Barden. And I remembered as he was preaching away that night, he looked out at the whole church and he said, do you want revival to happen? And they said, yes. He spoke up a little louder. Do you want to see revival happen? They said, amen. He said it a third time and they shouted even louder. He said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get a piece of chalk. I want you to walk out into your concrete driveway. And I want you to squat down. And I want you to draw a circle that encloses both of your feet. And while you're squatting down there, bow your head and pray. And ask God to bring revival to everybody inside that circle. A clever way to look at where real revival begins. It's such a tendency of every one of us to look over here at that person, at that situation. Say what's wrong with it. But we need to start right here. Looking at our own lives and asking, are we living a Jesus first life? Are you living a Jesus first life? Is he most important in your life? Is he more important than even family, as valuable as they are? Is he more important than money, than work? Is he more important than your favorite hobby, your favorite sport, your favorite community involvement? Is he more important than the kind of house you live in, than the kind of car you drive, than the places you go? Is Jesus first in your life, and are you living a Jesus first life? That's the first way I want us to look at that. Then there's another way that we need to look at this. Not in terms of your life, but we need to look at it together. And we need to look at it in terms of this church. And did you notice something? I said this church. I didn't say our church. I didn't say your church. I didn't say my church. Because, folks, if we are going to live putting Jesus Christ first in everything, we have got to let go of the idea that this is our church, your church, my church. It's Jesus' church. And if you're going to live a life of putting Jesus first, you have got to realize that. Bad things happen when we take our eyes off of him and things don't go so hot. I heard a story one time, something from history, but, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful architectural structures is the Taj Mahal. Nearly 400 years old. Built in the 1630s. Here's how it started. About the year 1630, the ruler of India was a man named Shah Jahan Mahal. And in 1631, his wife, Mumtaz Mahal, tragically passed away while giving birth to their 14th child. Shah Jahan Mahal was grief-stricken. He was so sad because he loved her so much. And he had the Taj Mahal built in honor of her memory. It took 16 years to complete construction. And legend has it that a couple years into construction, one day Shah Jahan Mahal was kind of surveying the progress. He was walking through all the construction. He was evaluating the work they were doing. And as he was going here and there and through this place and that place, he suddenly bumped his leg on this big wooden crate. And I could only imagine what he said when he did that, but it wasn't good, was it? But as he tried to regain his composure, he looked at what had happened, he looked what was there, and he just asked, would somebody please get rid of this box? It is just here in the middle of everything in the way. And again, according to legend, one of the engineers came over and whispered to him and said that uh, the wooden box contained the casket of his dear departed, Mumtaz Mahal. 
You see, in all of his busy activity that day, he had forgotten the real reason for the whole structure. You know, it can happen the same way in the church. You know what? One of the biggest temptations that every church faces, it is this. It is to be extremely busy with a whole lot of activity while accomplishing nothing for the kingdom of God. And folks, that happens when we refuse to put Jesus Christ at the center of everything that we do. I want you to think about something today. Think in your mind right now, what is your favorite activity at Archdale United Methodist Church? What is your favorite thing to do here? Think about that in your mind right now. And as you think about that in your mind right now, let me ask you something. Is that something that Jesus did or taught when he was in the world? Is it something that the church did in its earliest days as we read about it in the book of Acts in the New Testament? Think about those things. Think about those things and think about what is most important. See, the challenge before us is to be a Jesus first church. And what would it be like if we put him first in everything? What would it be like if we put him first in the way that we worship, in the way that we pray, in the way that we serve? What would it be like if we put him first in the way we love one another and relate to one another and resolve our differences with one another? What would it be like if we put him first in the attitudes that we choose? What would it be like if we put him first in the way we reach out to this community and to the whole world? You see, my friends, my sisters and brothers, that's what a Jesus-first church really looks like. A Jesus-first life and a Jesus-first church. How many of you love to set goals, have dreams in life? Here we are, it's the second week of a new year. We're thinking about what we'd like to see happen in 2015, and we're still using that R word, resolutions, right? We think about how much weight we want to lose or something we want to do, somewhere we want to go, some achievement we want to attain. And those are all good things. But I want you to do something right now with all of those goals. Just push them to the side for just a moment. Push them to the side and, and consider this right now. What would it be like if each and every one of us went to Jesus in prayer and said, Jesus, my supreme desire is that you would be first in every part of my life. What would it be like if each one of us prayed that way? And what would it be like if all of us prayed and said, Lord, it is our desire that you, Jesus, would be first in every part of this church. I guarantee you, it would be the most satisfying and life-changing prayer that you have ever prayed. Because, folks, that is a prayer that he would answer in a wonderful and powerful way. You see, there's no greater joy than living a life in which Jesus is first in everything. And that's what we're invited to do today. Let me ask you this morning, do you really believe all this stuff about Jesus? All these things that we claim to be? We just got through celebrating Christmas and rejoicing in that great miracle about how God took on human flesh and came and lived with us. Do you believe that really happened? Do you believe that Jesus came into this world and went through all of life as we know it? Do you believe that he, he really healed the sick and performed miracles? Do you believe that he taught these great things about God? Do you believe that he really went to a cross and suffered and died for the sins of the world? Do you believe that he really rose again from the dead? Do you believe that he reigns in heaven above over the whole universe? Do you believe that he forgives us for everything wrong we've ever done? Do you believe that he offers us a new beginning, the greatest second chance of all? Do you believe that he gives us joy and peace and hope? Do you believe that he offers us meaning and purpose? Do you believe that he offers us everlasting life? Do you believe all of these things about this Jesus? 
If you do in your heart of hearts, then do you know the response should be the same for every one of us? To give our lives to him and decide that he's going to be first in absolutely everything. A Jesus first life, a Jesus first church. That's what I hear from the word of God today. As Paul speaks of Jesus and says that in everything he might have the supremacy. Do you know what the most powerful word is in that statement? That in everything he might have the supremacy. The most powerful word there is the word might. Because you know what it tells us? It tells us we've all got a decision to make. We've all got a choice to make. And what about you? Are you going to live a Jesus first life? And are we going to be a Jesus first church? It was back about 1998. I was serving as the pastor of Waxhaw United Methodist Church. And in my time there, I got to meet a woman in town. Her name was Becky. The reason I got to know her is her daughter, Kathy, ran the uh, preschool at the church. Becky was a real nice and kind, upbeat, encouraging person. And I still remember that day I got a phone call, an emergency call, telling me that Becky's house had just been completely destroyed by fire. And I remember immediately hopping in the car and heading over to the house and seeing the smoke from quite a distance. But I pulled into that long driveway and over kind of in the yard. And I got out and started looking for Becky. And I saw her and I went over and gave her a big hug and asked her if there was anything we could do. We would be willing to do it to help her out at this time. And then I'll never forget what she said. She said, Stuart, for a moment I... I thought I had lost practically everything. But then I found out they were able to salvage one thing from the rubble. She said it was my favorite Bible. The Bible I read each day. And the Bible that reminds me of how much Jesus loves me. And Stuart, when it comes down to it, that's all I really need. I'll never forget that moment. And I'll never forget the statement she was making. What she was doing was making a statement that she was going to live a Jesus first life. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for all you've done for us, freely, unconditionally. We praise you for that. But Lord, with grateful hearts, we want to give all of ourselves to you. Lord, help each one of us right now in our own hearts to say, Jesus, my desire is that you would be first in my life. And help all of us together to pray and say, Lord Jesus, our desire is that you would be first in this church. Lord, as much as we desire those things, we can't bring them about in our own power. But you can. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your love. And help us to live each day putting you first. And help us to be the church that puts you first. We ask it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing together, Jesus is all the world to me. And I ask you today, is he all the world to you? Is he your everything? This morning as we pray, you may want to come and just kneel at the altar and pray. You may have something on your heart you want to share with the Lord. 
But you may want to come and pray today and say, Lord Jesus, I desire that you would be first. And I want to live for you always. You may want to pray for Archdale United Methodist Church. That we would put Jesus first in everything. I just invite you to come as we sing. So let's stand, let's sing together. Jesus is all the world to me. And he is our friend, the best friend we can ever have. Jesus is all the world to you and to me. He's our everything. So go from this place now, depending upon him, to take care of everything in your life. And as you go, go resolved to live for him and to put him first always. Amen.